So I get to introduce this week's speaker. So I think everybody knows this week's speaker is Dane Jacob. He's a graduate student, PhD candidate in our program. And Dane's been in my lab since a month after I got here. So Dane's been in the lab seven years. He started as an undergrad research assistant. And then he, um, there's a program through American Physiological Society that if you've done less than nine months of research, you can apply to be a summer undergraduate research fellow. So Dane was in the lab about a month when he applied for and got, which is a pretty prestigious undergraduate research fellow. Um, he got paid for the summer and he got to go to the next American Physiological Society meeting the next spring. And essentially he's been doing research ever since. So he has been incredibly active in the lab. He's gotten his own funding. He has a Provost Scholars Fellowship. He's got an American Heart Association pre-doctoral fellowship. Um, he also had a nutrition exercise physiology, a summer undergraduate research fellowship. I mean, if we went through his CV, if he had an opportunity to apply for something, he did. And he's really been really successful. Um, I was going to look up the number of publications he has before I came. It's got to be at least four. 11, okay. <laughs> so Dane has 11 publications, um, the majority of them first author. So he's really been integral, right? He was in the lab since um, I was in the lab. And so anything that the labs have published in the last seven years, Dane has really been a part of. And so we've been very lucky to have him. He'll be here for probably another six months or so um, by the time he wraps up his dissertation. So I don't, I mean, I could list all of the awards. He's got the American Physiological Society Gatorade Award. Um, he's received the Barbara Horowitz Undergraduate Research Award. Um, there's a lot. You can ask him to see your CV later. But it just shows he, when he's asked to do something, he does it. Um, he really has taken every opportunity to be a mentor in the lab. He just had a mentee that presented a postdoc undergraduate research show. Um, so we've been really lucky to have him. We're going to miss him. And I'm really excited that he's the last speaker of the summer because I think it's really good. One. So with that, I will take a seat and we'll let you go. Oh. I don't really know how to follow that up except to say thank you. Um, it is a huge honor. I appreciate you guys coming who are not required to come. Um, but yeah, so this is going to be a little bit different today because I think that I'm probably just a little bit different than most seminar speakers, but I'm going to go ahead and start it out with a quote, unless it's frozen. All right, now we're rock and rolling. Uh, this is what Socrates said when he was, um, basically up for what they call treason back in the Greek, um, the Greek and Roman times. Essentially, he was given the option to either abandon science or to be sentenced to death. And this was his response, and that's pretty gnarly. Um, I don't know if I'd go that far, but I, I really like science too. But he really believed that philosophy or the love of wisdom uh, was the most important pursuit above all else. And I feel like I've been doing that for a little bit now, so that's nice. Um, so I hate when people talk about themselves, so I'm going to keep it brief. But and Jackie already basically said, you know, the majority of the slide, but back in 2014, I actually started as an agribusiness management major. Um, I had big dreams of taking over the family farm. That is actually my father's farm down in the, the butt heel or the boot heel, excuse me, of Missouri. Uh, those are pecan trees. Um, we've got several hundred pecan trees, which are now producing and could make a nice living, which sounds pretty nice. Um, but anyway, I took a semester of agribusiness management and I quickly realized that the supply and demand of corn is as exciting as it sounds, which to me was not very. So after that, I transitioned to NEP, which was formerly in the College of HES, um, which no longer exists. I really kind of floated through school. I didn't really have much direction. Like I showed up and I did the work, but I didn't know where I was going and I didn't know what I was doing. And then eventually I took NEP 3850, which as you guys know, is exercise physiology with Dr. Canale. The TA at the time was Ying. Many of you know, she's excellent. She's the best. Um, and Jill Barnes was my grader, which is just wild to me, um, especially because Jill gave a talk earlier this semester. Uh, at any rate, I just really loved the content. I was actually excited to show up for that class, and it made sense to me in my brain, in my small brain. The thick equation made sense. Um, and so I went up to Cali one day after class, and I was like, hey, 
I really enjoy this. How can I get more involved? And I want to say that the butterfly effect is real because if I had never got up out of that seat and went and asked her, I would be standing here today, which is to me kind of crazy. Um, but she then steered me towards Jackie Lindbergh, uh, who was a brand new faculty member at that time. And the rest is history, as they say. But that history is right here. So <laughs> she pretty much covered this slide. But real briefly, this was six years ago when I joined the lab as an undergraduate research assistant, unpaid, volunteering, doing kind of more or less grunt work, unfortunately, but I really enjoyed it. And it was really rewarding at the time. And uh, throughout that time, I learned how to do like venipuncture, which you could still do pretty crazy. Got direct authorization from Dr. Harden. That was cool. Um, and then, like she said, I was selected for a pretty prestigious summer fellowship, which really just kind of kickstarted everything. I then graduated with a bachelor's in the fall of 2018 um, and immediately transitioned to the master's program because I, like I said, unsure of the time. And so she was just like, well, you could stay and do your master's. And I did. Um, I would recommend taking some time off. You guys are all in graduate school now, so it's too late. Um, at any rate, I went to my first conference in the spring of 2019. And like she said, I won an award for that research I did in the summer. And uh, that was a huge hit of dopamine. And uh, so then that brings me to the topic of today's lecture is our lab. And I'm not an artist, but I do like to give credit to people. And we've got in the middle, we've got Sam, Aubrey, Braden, and Halen. Those are our undergrads. If you notice the graduate students in our postdoc cash, we're all kind of keep that foundation, but I would definitely like to give explicit credit to the undergrads. Uh, because without them, we would not be standing. Uh, this is the Parthenon, too. It's kind of the Greek theme. Uh, and then we have Matt and Neil hanging out <laughs> because they have also been instrumental to the success of our lab and help out with studies. So, all right, so there's steps that we got to get to before we can get to the data. So I'm going to start out with sex differences. Um, so as you guys know, really, for decades, the default human model was a 70-kilogram male. Everything we know physiologically is based off that. And unfortunately, it wasn't until 1993 when NIH was like, whoa, this is kind of messed up. Maybe we should do something about that. And they enacted the Revitalization Act. Uh, and it basically just says that you need, we just, they were like, you have to have females in your studies, which is like, come on, you know, this is, we're in 93 here. It's as old as I am. I don't want to date myself, but it's, it has not been that long since it was required to uh, have, incorporate females in your studies unless some kind of clear and compelling uh, justification is provided. Now, apparently that's still not enough because in 2014, they then incorporated sex as a biological variable, meaning that you now as an NIH funded researcher have to incorporate or at least acknowledge sex or sex chromosomes as a biological variable in your research, in your proposals. Now, since then, that was what? I can't do math seven years ago. Uh, but we, we have really progressed a lot, but I think we also have a really um, long way to go. And so since then, philosophical arguments have like erosion and, you know, whether we should control for the menstrual cycle or whether we should control for the menstrual cycle. And I think that the best science that really accounts for these variables in your science and how it relates specifically to your outcome, because one will increase external validity, but one will increase scientific rigor. Who's right? It depends on the study. Um, last week, uh, AJP Harden Search just published this big, long editorial on the decision tree for sex as a biological variable. It's a pretty good read. I don't 100% personally agree with all of it, but it's, it gives really good guidelines. I'll say that. Um, so anyway, we'll move on to the topic of today, which is blood pressure sex differences. So this figure right here is really just kind of like, in my mind, the poster child of our lab. As you can see on the y axis, we have the thought of blood pressure, the x axis is age. So, women all the way up, or sorry, getting ahead of myself, we got blood pressure guidelines on the right. 130, that's stage one hypertension. That's not good. Women all the way up until about the age of 62 are protected from hypertension. At about the age of 60, both women and men have hypertension on average. This is taken from a huge cohort of 30,000 Americans. At that break point, 
at the age of 60, something happens to women. I think we, and if you don't know in this room, you should probably crack a textbook, but it's menopause. <laughs> and following that, they have a much steeper increase in blood pressure as they age. And in fact, they actually, towards the end of life, really get into that stage two hypertension above 140 uh, millimeters of mercury. That's not good, guys. And we want to figure out why this is happening, try to figure out what's protecting these women, and hopefully we can translate it and help them have better outcomes for their lives. And so then you might wonder, oh, is more hypertension, is stage two hypertension worse than stage one? For sure, you will, you're more likely to die. So the United States will be black circles. So you start out right here, you're about 76. That's still normal blood pressure. You get up to about 82, there's about 40 deaths per 10,000. From 82 to about, mm, we'll call that 88, you have almost a twofold increase in deaths related to cardiovascular or congestive heart failure in this instance. From 85 to 95, you're going from about, what did I say, 75 to 100. That's essentially a threefold increase from your baseline, from normal blood pressure up to stage two hypertension. You're more likely to die. So what raises your blood pressure? Um, looking at politics, particularly my father, I think. I wonder if he's listening. I hope he is. Um, Smoking cigarettes is not good for your blood pressure. Whatever this guy is doing is not good for your blood pressure. And then apparently some people look at this and it raises their blood pressure. That's not a screenshot from my phone. I promise. And so now we're going to take the next step into blood pressure regulation and talk about neurovascular physiology. Um, I like science history. Uh, you got to be careful with that. The comedian Shane Gillis said loving history is like the next step to becoming a Republican, but um, I'm apolitical. I'm explicitly apolitical. At any rate, this guy, W.B. Cannon, um, if you've gone to an APS uh, national conference, you notice that they've got the W.B. Cannon lecture namesake. That's this guy. Uh, he studied the sympathetic nervous system, and as we know, it's the primary, or I'm telling you now, it's the primary regular in BTB blood pressure. So if he really coined the term fight or flight, as well as homeostasis. So he would do these crazy experiments where he would stimulate the nerve endogenously, the sympathetic nervous system, and then he'd also inject adrenaline for epinephrine. And he got two different outcomes. And so his explanation of this was that there was two forms of the chemical release messenger, we have an E, which excites and compassed an eye for inhibitory. Unfortunately, this wasn't exactly correct when he passed away in 1945. This other guy, a Swede named Von Mueller, he correctly identified that it's two distinct neurotransmitters, and he identified it as norepinephrine. And for that work, he was awarded um, a Nobel Prize, which he probably should have shared with this guy, W.B. Cannon. Uh, at any rate, like I said, he got a namesake lecture, which is usually a Nobel laureate. Um, but the point of this is that the sympathetic nervous system releases uh, norepinephrine predominantly. So what does it do exactly? So you've got this nerve terminal right here. Um, as everyone knows, nerves operate electrical, electrochemical transmission. The nerve depolarizes, chemicals are released into the synaptic cleft. They can then bind to receptors either on a blood vessel or your target organ that causes a physiologic function. In this instance, norepinephrine primarily binds to alpha-1 and nergic receptors, which causes an increase in blood pressure. In our lab, we can actually record and quantify the electrical sympathetic activity uh, with a technique called micronography, so you are familiar with this. Uh, the nerve that we record from is called the common perineal nerve. There's also a fibular nerve. It's got like several different names. And it sits kind of laterally and posterior to uh, your fibular head right there. This is flipped. So if you took, this is looking at the back of your knee right here. And you can see as it runs right here, then bifurcate, we would be trying to in, more or less impale it right about there. This is what the actual setup looks like, um, which I've been trained on over the past couple of years. It's been a, a really a joy and pleasure to learn this technique. It's uh, very addicting. Um, but at any rate, you use an ultrasound to then guide in 
the microelectrode directly into the nerve or adjacent to it at least, to then measure the electrical impulse that we can detect with different uh, flexion of the foot and apparent responses. So this is what that looks like, that activity right here. Each little uh, spike or triangle is what we call a burst, and that's how we quantify it. This is a real-time blood pressure uh, recording above it, and as you can see, and you kind of have to squint a little bit, so like blood pressure will fall, and then you'll see some burst, and then blood pressure will go back up. It's very tied to, like I said, the B2B regulation of blood pressure. And so past studies have shown that the quantification or the amount of burst that you have correlates well with at least plasma or interstitial uh, norepinephrine release. So we're able to measure the electrical activity to then get a good indicator of the neurochemical release. So that then brings me back to this figure and uh, it makes me question, is there a role in studying our system? So this is young males. And like I showed you that uh, quantification of sympathetic nervous system, this is first type on the X axis. So basically more activity or more neural transmitter would be an increase on the X axis. And then you've got diastolic blood pressure on the, on the Y axis. So for an increase in burst height, you have an increase in diastolic blood pressure. <coughs> now in young females, this is totally absent, or at least it's uncoupled. So this just shows me that there's less sympathetic support of blood pressure in younger females relative to young males. But what about older postmenopausal females? Well, like I said, males have this nice slope where they respond to sympathetic stimulation. Females do not. When they get older, they do. They have less sympathetic support in younger females, and this is reversed after menopause. So this makes me think hmm, maybe the sympathetic nervous system might be contributing in older female bodies. So just as a quick recap. Young healthy females are generally protected from hypertension. In following menopause, they are at greater risk. And this may be in part mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. And so, what does it all mean? Well, I can't answer it because we don't know yet, but I'll try. And so, we're going to transition to hypoxia because I like bearing bark. <laughs> and this is the last step I promise before I get to the day. So, what is hypoxia? It really is truly a mismatch between the supply and demand of oxygen to the metabolically active tissue. In case you're not familiar, hypoxemia is a reduced blood oxygen saturation, whereas hypoxia is in reference to a tissue. I'll probably use them interchangeably. But you can have localized tissue of hypoxia, I think, in your brain if you have a stroke, um, or in the periphery if you have a blood clot. And you can also have systemic hypoxia without tissue hypoxia. Meaning when you go to altitude or an altitude trained athlete, it can compensate uh, for that reduction in blood oxygen saturation. This causes cellular tissue and organ changes to attempt to maintain phenotypic function because otherwise us as mammals and creatures would not be able to survive. Um, and it elicits physiologic adaptations, otherwise known as hormesis. Um, the classic example, at least for exercise physiology, which I learned in advanced exercise, would be the live high, train low. So you get the benefits of being at altitude and then you can use those benefits at sea level. But it also may elicit dysfunction uh, either chronically or pathologically and really the dose makes the poison and I'll touch on that a little bit. But acute hypoxia causes an increase in the sympathetic nervous system and I've told you six times that the sympathetic nervous system increases blood pressure, at least in males. But in hypoxia, you get this increase, but you still see vasodilation. And that's uh, due to local metabolites um, from the muscle right here. This is taken from one of these people with the papers. But so you've got, like I said, so local metabolites from the muscle then act upon the blood vessel in tandem with uh, an increase in sympathetic activity. And you have to increase blood flow in order to deliver enough oxygen in a compromised oxygen environment. And in my mind, there's really two flavors of hypoxia, um, and they are environmental and pathologic. So just because I like this kind of stuff, this is environmental hypoxia. So on the left is Edmund Hillary, and then we've got Tim, this guy, Timothy Morgan. He's a Sherpa. The Sherpa are a people, not an um, a, uh, occupation. And these guys were the first two to summit Mount Everest in 1959. Above 26,000 feet, it's known as the death zone. Uh, you will, uh, 
a lab manager told me that everyone's going to die eventually because I said you'll die above the death zone. So I now have to say you will die much more rapidly than you otherwise would uh, above the death zone on Mount Everest as it is insufficient to sustain human life. It causes pulmonary edema, brain swelling. The only treatment when you're in this environmental condition is to descend as rapidly as possible. If you look at the death count on Everest, it is not cool. We should probably stop trying to climb it for multiple reasons. At any rate, acute acclimatization occurs days to weeks uh, to compensate and result in increased respiration, heart rate, and increase in EPO. If you're familiar with the Tour de France, you've probably heard of that before. Uh, and like I've beaten a dead horse, elevated sympathetic nervous system activity. It's really interesting. Chronic adaptations occur with generations at altitude. Primarily the Andean, Tibetan, and Ethiopian are the three major ones. And they all have identical genetic changes. You can see this blood is taken from an Andean from a uh, research expedition from these guys from Canada. And if you've ever spawned human blood, it shouldn't be this much. It should probably be like right about there. It should be really half and half plasma red blood cells. Their oxygen carrying capacity is increased because of all these red cells. At any rate, there's some recent data to show that um, an ancient species of humans uh, also interbred with Homo sapiens to give Tibetans specifically um, different adaptations. They actually don't have, Tibetans don't have an increase in hemoglobin as opposed to the Indians. So I thought that that was cool. You should read the book Sapiens if that interests you. The pathologic, so it's hallmark of a lot of conditions. COVID 19, people died of hypoxia, COPD. I'm going to talk about sleep apnea today. There is a strongly related, the strong relation, excuse me, between hypoxia and hypertension and eventual cardiovascular disease. And those who have sleep apnea, 50% also have hypertension. Those with resistant hypertension, meaning they've been given two drugs to try to treat this, they also have concomitant sleep apnea. As everyone knows in this room, hypertension is unequivocally the number one cause of cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular disease. It's the number one killer for in America. So this is what sleep apnea looks like. It comes in two forms. You've got obstructive, which is anatomical. Typically, the esophagus collapsed and unable to breathe. Or you have central, uh, which is neurological. The drive to breathe while you're asleep is not there. Whenever you hear like a puppy like snoring or something like that, you're like, oh, that's cute, or like a little kid snoring, that's not good. <laughs> they are not breathing. They're depriving the brain of oxygen. Uh, at any rate, it's characterized by this repeated intermittent sensations in breathing that results in O2 desaturation or hypoxia. Uh, this is a gradient disease. You can have a little bit, a lot of it, or a lot, a lot of it. Uh, and that's diagnosed by your oxygen desaturation index, your apnea hypopnea index, which is how many times you either stop breathing or desaturate at night. Uh, and the hallmark of this disease is increased in the nervous system activity. And then not to mention this powerful disruption to sleep quality. But to go ahead and get over to this figure, we've got airflow right here. Whenever you breathe in, you actually, so what's going on, this guy has both. Basically, he's trying to breathe in right here. You can see this. So that's going to be your obstructive, or this guy's probably just none. Whenever you try to breathe in right here, this is your esophageal pressure. You create a negative pressure when you pull against something. You can't create that. As you see, the oxygen saturation plummeting, right? But eventually, he breaks that free and is able to take some breaths, two or three breaths right here, where he rebounds oxygen saturation. During this time, his blood pressure falls back to normal because it's saturated with oxygen. Again, he stops breathing. O2 falls. He's trying to up, 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 up. Finally, your great uncle took a breath. It's also when you fall down right here, when, you're, when you start to desaturate, your sympathetic nervous system is just going haywire. When you resaturate, it kind of calms down. So, what about sex and the incidence of hypoxic diseases? This is just females on this, uh, premenopausal and postmenopausal. I think they had to be five years postmenopausal. Zero to 10 is no sleep apnea. Amongst this cohort, 75% were premenopausal. When you start getting to the mild, there's a staggering increase in sleep apnea prevalence, and it just gets worse with the severity of sleep apnea. This is moderate to severe sleep apnea right here. 
What about outcomes though? So you have it, is it worse? So you've got min over here on the left, you've got left ventricular mass index on the y-axis. And then this is essentially a dose dependent. So you have no sleep apnea, mild, which is a couple ap apnea tonight, about 15. And then moderate and severe, like I said. When the hypoxic burden gets worse in males, you really don't see as much of an increase in left ventricular mass. But in contrary, in females, for each uh, severity, of the, the greater the hypoxic burden, the worse it gets for left, left ventricular mass index. And if you're unaware, the most common cause of left ventricular hypertrophy in a pathological condition, not an exercise condition, would be high blood pressure because you're trying to inject against a high pressure gradient, thus increasing the left ventricular mass, which will eventually lead to congestive heart failure. So in our lab and in others, there's sleep apnea models. Uh, we call it intermittent hypoxia. You basically dose someone with little hypoxic events to replicate uh, what happens in people with actual sleep apnea. And this, they're not asleep. So that's like a, that's a variable that's taken out as well. Uh, but this is from a seven day model of sleep apnea. Uh, you got control day one through seven. And then this is your average blood pressure. So you've got, I know it's tough to see. You've got your female square right here. They get a little bit of an increase in blood pressure. This is over seven days too. But when you over them uh, and take those uh, sex, sex organs and hormones out, they look to me just like the males. Um, so that's indicative of their sex hormones being protective of an increase in blood pressure. This is in humans down here. I love this one because they did just a single bout of maximal what they call inexpiratory apnea. So you breathe in, you breathe out all the way, and then you hold it as long as possible. It kind of sucks if you've ever tried it. But so this is 15 seconds in. This is the last three cardiac cycles, and then the first three cardiac cycles of the inhale. Um, and as you can see, young women, oh, cut that off. This is blood flow. This is brachial flow velocity, excuse me. But men have a reduction in flow velocity that gets worse and then gets worse the more they're acutely hypoxic. Women don't respond to that at all. There it is. As they get older, when they incorporate older women, well, during the beginning of the apnea, they don't have, they don't respond, but the severity of the hypoxia, they respond just like the males. I mean, they have a reduction in blood flow in response to the hypoxic asthma. One time, one time. So this really tells me that there are differences between males and females in response to hypoxia that may or may not be uh, due to the sympathetic nervous system. We don't know. So we wanted to find out. We like violence and data. So we wanted to understand the sex differences uh, between young, healthy males and females, like we saw in that one little afternoon event that seemed to be there uh, in response to 30 minutes of intermittent hypoxia. Um, and we had a pretty large uh, cohort. Uh, Jackie brought them from the Mayo Clinic. And then this was really the first study I worked on, which is kind of crazy to uh, look back on. Anyway, so if you've worked with human subjects, you know that they're pretty finicky and you have to tell them all these rules and regulations so that we can, our science can be as clean as it can be. So we told them not to drink, caffeinate, take any insects, count all ibuprofen, or strenuous exercise for 24 hours prior to the study of this. Um, we had comprehensive, except for blood flow, uh, hemodynamic measures taken from this, and we measured mass respiration. And then, like I said before, or like I showed you, we were able to quantify synthetic nervous system activity with the microelectrodes here. So we hypothesized that we would observe an increase in sympathetic activity and blood pressure in young, healthy males that would be apt for young females. Seems pretty reasonable, right? So we exposed them to this experimental hypoxia protocol, and this is what that looks like. To me, this is like really beautiful. I think that's the nerd in me talking, but it's very aesthetically pleasing. I'll base your eyes in the oxygen percentage right here, and everything else is gonna follow it. So every time this oxygen falls, you see a little increase in tidal volume because they breathe more. And you see a little increase, this boom, 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 and heart rate too. I'll have you know, so, it's controlled by the switching valve, which is right here. So it just pops 
every 30 or 90 seconds, they didn't know which one they were on. A lot of these people fall asleep during it. We kind of had to be like, hey, buddy, hey, gal, I need you to kind of look around the room because we didn't want them to actually become apneic. Uh, as well, which we tested for. They did not have to be that yet. At any rate, their oxygen saturation declines. This is too compressed to see anything, but it really is a great model of moderate to severe sleep apnea. Now, this was our characteristics. Like I said, we had 30 men and 19 women. Uh, on average, you know, men are, they're also older, uh, taller, bigger, uh, and had slightly higher systolic blood pressure, although these are both well below uh, stage one hypertension disease over, or even the elevated or stage one. So these were our results. Um, following intermittent hypoxia, there were no sex differences in heart rate. There were no sex differences in stroke volume. First incidence and frequency both went up right here with your delta right here. And they were not different between men and women. So the activity of the nervous system did not change. What we did see was that diastolic blood pressure was actually lower in females. So we didn't really expect to see that. So over here, you see men, they go up. Women, they went down. Their blood pressure increased in, or decreased, excuse me, in response to kind of an insult to the body. Um, so we really weren't sure what was going on there. But to conclude with that study, uh, we saw similar increases in sympathetic nervous system activity. Uh, females are protected from an increase in blood pressure, and this was independent of any thing we measured, which was a lot more stuff than what I put on here, but any respiratory, autonomic, or cardiovascular variable we measured. Males do have an increase in blood pressure, and it is nice when you confirm and extend data from prior studies. So to me, that raises two important questions. Why are females protected, and what is the mechanism of increasing blood pressure in males? Which I'm going to start with the latter. So we thought it could be endothelin one, um, and those that are not in the lab, endothelin one is a peptide hormone with receptors located mainly on the smooth muscle. It's a it's a kind of a bad boy player in the cardiovascular system. It's a potent vasoconstrictor. Uh, it is pro-fibrotic, pro-oxidative, and pro-inflammatory. And these processes, all of these processes, are known uh, to be either you know they're associated with sleep apnea. What I should say. Um, so it's also associated with vascular dysfunction and disease state. Uh, preclinical data in male rats over here after uh, an uh, intermittent hypoxia insult, they took out their um, oxygen sensing uh, mechanism, your uh, carotid chemo receptors, and they saw that endothelin one was way up. So they thought that mm, maybe this is increasing sympathetic outflow or vasoconstriction directly, it could be a bimodal pathway. Um, also in rats, they treated, they did, uh, they had a jam vehicle, the DQ is an EQ A and B receptor antagonist. Um, and so they treated uh, these rats with that and they did, uh, this is all at baseline right here, day zero and 14 days of intermittent hypoxia. So it should be noted that so that's a little bit lower, but we'll talk about that more later. You get a massive increase in blood pressure with 14 days of intermittent hypoxia that is totally ameliorated or blunted uh, with this deep use in the human receptor antagonist. So, bosentin is a drug clinically available for use in pulmonary hypertension. Um, and I think that that sparked some eyes. So, we called the guys that we studied back and said, hey, can we give you this drug? Can we do it again? And can we see if we can block that increase of blood pressure? So, in the subset of, of the previous cohort, the guys are like, yeah, you know, we're gone home or whatever. We, this bosentin is, is kind of a, it is a little bit of an intense drug. Uh, you have to buy FDA ruling, have normal liver function, so we tested their ability to resume their health and all that good stuff. Uh, and then they took bosentin, uh, EP1 blockade, for three days prior. Um, at 135 milligrams per day, and in the morning up, took one last 62.5 milligrams. So, mm -hmm. these visits were not randomized because we wanted this narrow data, and they were not blinded to the drug because they did not a not give them a placebo, and b because the drug shifts for a particular house. Uh, pretty pretty on that. Uh, all the other variables that we measured were the same, uh, and we hypothesized that bosentin would ameliorate the rise of synthetic activity and blood pressure, similar to what we saw in the drugs following a few intermittent 
pot here. So this is all the same. I will harp on this except for a favorite plot. So in the gray bars, we have our control, and the white bars, we have our above sentiment. So this is plasma interferon one. I found this to be very interesting that their interferon one concentrations were actually increased in the plasma because it couldn't bind and probably be in so end up psychotic, would be my guess. Um, but the change between the increase in interferon one, the circulating interferon one was not different from control. Um, at baseline, they actually had greater sympathetic activity, um, but the increase again was no different. And that's probably due to this down here, that they actually had, this is pre-intermittent hypoxia at baseline, they had much lower uh, resting blood pressure. But the increase in blood pressure was not different from their other visits. So just to conclude, endothelium one blockade did not affect the increase in blood pressure. So the conclusion to that is that interferon one is important for baseline blood pressure regulation, but it doesn't want the increase in blood pressure again to intermittent hypoxia. Uh, there's been some more recent data implicating some other mechanisms, which I'm happy to talk more about. Um, but so we kind of crossed that off the list, or at least someone else did for us, but we narrowed the, the field of view. But that then leads us to the final uh, study that we'll talk about. And, the question that probably interests me more, uh, to be frank. So I've shown you time and time again that young, healthy women are protected from hypertension or they don't respond to sympathetic activity or acute apneas right here. Following menopause, this is all reversed. Worse off. So that makes you also think the role of sex hormones might be doing something. Um, like I told you before, in that rodent uh, model that overectomy abolished the blunt, the blunted increase in uh, blood pressure. And then when you take uh, postmenopausal females, you actually can give them estrogen ABAC in a specific form, the transdermal estrogen. They have a decrease in synthetic nerve activity. So that I found that interesting. But really, we wanted to determine the role of um, estrogen in young, healthy females in response to them. So, this is no small feat if you're a human clinical researcher, uh, but we studied females twice during the initial cycle. They were not on any oral hormonal contraceptives. Uh, I believe they, were, they could have been on a copper IUD, but no exogenous hormones of any kind, essentially. And we compare that to males, and this is an all new data set uh, from my masters. So we study them once. The, the whoever doesn't know, the um, 30 day menstrual cycle is broken up into the early follicular phase, or the follicular phase, excuse me, and the luteal phase. And up at about day 14 of the menstrual cycle, this is also called ovulation, after the peaks. It then falls back down. Once you hit the luteal phase, you have a greater rise in progesterone, which is here in yellow. So we wanted to isolate the effects of estrogen without the concomitant effects of progesterone on our model and see how that might impact the response to uh, sleep apnea or model sleep apnea. We added some more to this because we did not do uh, the micronography of the sympathetic nervous system mechanism. It is invasive, it is time consuming, it is very difficult, particularly in young healthy females, particularly because they have low activity. So it's hard to measure nothing. Uh, but at any rate, we did slap on blood flow, which is a, a good uh, measurement in what we wanted to know. And then we also, before and after the acute intermittent hypoxia protocol, which has not changed since the first time I told you about it. Uh, we did them what's called a cold press of test. I know some of the people in this room have done it. Uh, it's kind of like a sledgehammer to your nervous system. It's what it sounds like. It's just uncomfortable. Um, and just a little bit more history. This guy was a physician at the Mayo Clinic who developed this. And he did you know, two minutes of foot or hand night blood. And he saw that depending on your response to this test, your blood pressure increase, you're more likely than not to develop hypertension. So if you're spiking, then you're going to become pretty hypertensive. And then if you have these crazy spikes, they become hypertensive, blah, blah, blah. It's a clinical indicator. We didn't use it for that. We just used it to act as a 
So this was our participant characteristic. Uh, the males, they had this no difference in uh, low in estrogen compared to the low estradiol. Of course, their testosterone was higher. We did, however, see a pretty large increase in uh, estradiol. And I would also just like to put out, point out that we did phase three and one, which is uh, about as low as you can get, which is very difficult. Uh, kudos to our former lab manager, Jennifer, because she'd get a call, say, hey, my menstrual cycle has started. We got to schedule you in the next two, three, four days. Similarly, they take home at home ovulation kits. That's a one, two, three day situation. So you got to really rally the truth and get us in there. Uh, but we did it, I feel so we did a good job. So this is the main takeaway from that uh, study we did. Basically what we saw is that in these males, when you put their foot in ice water before they vasoconstrict, uh, and then afterwards they vasoconstrict some more. During the low estrogen phase, these women constrict after acute hypoxia, they statistically speaking constrict less. And this is Spain. It looks a little bit more robust to me during the high estrogen, but we didn't see that statistically speaking. Um, so they really blunted the vascular response to the sympathetic activation following acute intermittent hypoxia. And that was independent of menstrual cycle phase. Uh, the conclusion from that is that the vascular response is exactly what I said. I'm about to say. Uh, but there's been a lot of data showing, and we published that earlier this year, there's been a lot of data showing that that formesis or that formetic effect that I talked about earlier may have crazy implications across the board for neuroprotection, cognition. I mean, it's a it's a whole body insult, but an insult can elicit an adaptation. So I just wanted to throw this in here too. This uh, this is from a review published in data of y'all last month, two months ago. I don't know what data it is. Um, but so this observation where we saw that they may attenuate a blunt sympathetic activation may be built on further um, so that we might figure out things cool. Or we'll revisit it when we have more time. So really just to conclude and tie this all together is that the response to intermittent hypoxia in unhealthy males, they see an increase in blood pressure, females do not. Sympathetic response was the same. Um, and that blood pressure increase was not needed by EC1, although it does play a role in baseline blood pressure. Um, and circulating estrogen concentration doesn't affect the blood pressure response. We didn't see a change there, but it does affect the response to sympathetic activation uh, following acute intermittent hypoxia. And then really some of the underlying mechanisms uh, of these observations uh, have provided me with a foundation of my dissertation work, which will be next time. And that's all I got. So with that, I would really like to acknowledge, of course, uh, Dr. Weber, I mean, I wouldn't be here without her. Brian has been, you know, in the trenches with me forever. Um, I would also like to just briefly, you know, of course, Ning and Ben and Becky were no longer, you know, working here. They've been really you known, very helpful. All of our undergraduates, medical students, uh, all those guys. And I would like to just give a quick foot up to Alan. I wish you could be here today, but hopefully we'll make it back home. So thank you guys. With that, I'll take any questions. Not all at once. <laughs> So how are you guys uh, defining 